Many thanks to the Scottish Revival Network for inviting me to speak, and also to the Patrick Geddes Centre for hosting uh, this evening's online event. Well, uh, a thank you and perhaps an apology, um, because my talk really has very little to say about Geddes himself. He appears, I'm afraid, in a rather minor role, one hardly befitting of an event titled Patrick Geddes and the Revival. However, I know that I can rely on my fellow speakers uh, to share their more relevant expertise, allowing me, with your kind permission, to go off on something of a tangent. So the title of my paper today is The Revived Self, Occultism and Folklore at the Fin de Siecle. And then I would like to explore what the broader culture of the Scottish Revival might have to tell us about the making of the modern subject which sounds rather grand, but more simply, I guess my interest lies with how the preoccupations of the Scottish Revival as a literary, artistic and intellectual movement might speak in some ways to the fantasy X sense of itself as a time of great change and shift. So for many, the turn of the century was experienced as a kind of altered reality, one just coming into existence and one which required new ways of thinking and new ways of being in the world. Or at least this was certainly the view of the Irish poet William Butler Yeats, who in an 1895 essay predicted that a seismic shift was about to occur in Western society. I cannot get out of my mind, he confessed, that this age of criticism is about to pass and an age of imagination, of emotion and moods of revelation is about to come in its place. For certainly belief in the supersensual world is at hand again. Writing at the close of the 19th century, signs of this coming revolution could be gleaned from numerous and highly varied cultural sources. In London, the Society for Psychical Research was, were pursuing serious investigations into spiritualistic phenomena, while Madame Blavatsky espoused the wisdom of the East as a route to modern self-knowledge, and theos theosophical societies sprung up around the country and in many cities and in several cities across Scotland. And popular periodicals like Lucifer and the Occult Review explored ancient hermetic practices and encouraged their readers to look to the pre-modern world for guidance. Yeats's foretold new age reflected this flowering and multifarious occultism, but his vision centered on a more specific agent of renewal, namely the Celt. As a key participant in what has been broadly termed the Celtic revival, he was deeply invested in the political, artistic, and spiritual potential of the movement. And though necessary distinctions must be drawn, of course, between its different expressions, between perhaps the politicized nationalism guiding the Irish literary revival and the more internationalistic outlook pursued by their Scottish counterparts, its contributors broadly shared in a desire to rediscover, reimagine, and reinvigorate Celtic traditions, literature, and folklore. In the process, they were of course compelled to engage with a related inheritance, Matthew Arnold's 1867 study on the study of Celtic literature, which had argued for the existence of a distinctly Celtic element in literature, identified this as typically feminine, um, superstitious and naturally spiritual, poetic qualities that, according to Arnold, justified the Celts' political submission to the, ration, uh, the rationally minded and able-bodied Saxon. By contrast, for a new generation of revivalists, this spiritual, mystical, and ancient Celtic essence was reimagined as a means of transforming the English-speaking world, a way of rewriting culture along radically different lines. And in my talk uh, this afternoon, I guess I would like to think about how this blueprint for a new world was written, and to suggest that part of the work performed by the Scottish Revival involved a reimagining of the unconscious mind and a reconfiguration uh, of its creative powers. Okay, so to begin, I'm gonna work through kind of one key example. So I wanna to turn to a series of letters that were sent by Yeats to two Scottish writers associated with the Scottish revival. The journalist, William Sharp, and a mysterious Highland novelist named Fiona MacLeod. Connected through common literary endeavors, the three also shared membership to the period's premier magical society, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Established in 1887, this secretive and hierarchical order synthesized several occult traditions, including Renaissance and Egyptian magic, uh, Western esotericism, various Eastern religious traditions, and Neoplatonianism, to produce a unique system of magical training for its initi initiated adepts. Members were schooled in astral travel, incantation, and scrying methods by which to explore not only the deeper regions of the self, but also other worlds and non-human realms. 
And these explorations were underpinned by several texts, decoded by one of the founding members, William Wynne Westcott, and containing within them the rituals and graduated teachings that the movement would eventually adopt. Temples were later established outside of London, in Western Supermare, Bradford, Paris, and eventually in Edinburgh, where the Aben Ra Temple was founded in 1893. So sadly, the exact location of this temple is not known, um, but we do know that it was in operation for, until 1912, and that its initiates included the novelist and theosophist John Brodie Innes, the anthropologist Robert Falcon, and the astronomer William Peck. Um, and as my fellow panelist Michael Shaw has explored um, in his work, the firmest link between uh, the Amun Ra temple and the public literary world inhabited by Patrick Geddes and the like uh, was formed through the Cornish writer Ricardo Stevens, who was an, an initiate of the temple and a contributor to the Evergreen. The magical work of the Golden Dawn was, though I want to suggest, bound up with the creative endeavours of the Scottish Revival in some less material and perhaps less obvious ways. So Yeats's letter to William Sharp and Fiona MacLeod get to something of what I mean by that. So in May 1980, uh, 1898, rather, Yeats had travelled to Paris to work with Samuel Liddell McGregor, uh, McGregor Mathers one of the founding members of the order, and, Moyna, and his partner Moyna, Mathe, Moyna Mathis. Uh, and one evening, while undertaking shared magical rites, uh, the group encountered the astral form of a man dressed in a number of clan tartans, whose presence in the room appeared to communicate some form of psychic trauma, uh, a form of psychic tra trauma that seemed to be attached to Fiona MacLeod. Writing to Sharp the following morning, Yates recounted the unsettling incident and requested that he pass on an enclosed and sealed le letter uh, addressed to MacLeod as soon as possible. So in this sealed letter, we were offered a far more detailed account of the incident. Yates recounts how he was visited by, and I quote, the intellectual body of someone who was passing through an intense emotional crisis. And having confessed that he was inclined to believe that MacLeod was the spectral visitor, he asked, and I quote, were you either last night or Sunday night passing through some state of tragic feeling? Writing to Sharp again two days later, Yates advised that though he felt bound not to pry into their private affairs, he felt he must warn him not to, and I quote again, undertake any magical work with Miss McLeod until we meet, as you are both channels for some very powerful beings and some mistake has been made. So what are we as modern readers to make of this strange letter? It appears that through laborious incantations and the reading of ceremonial rites, a ghostly uh, emanation has been raised. A male figure, swathed in tartan, has appeared in the sitting room of a Paris apartment. But what is the nature of these powerful beings and what mistakes exactly have been made? More complicated still, we learn, from the tar we learn that this tartan-clad apparition, apparition is somehow representative of Yeats's female correspondent, a Scottish novelist and poet. What kinds of connections are being drawn between MacLeod's emotional state, some state of tragic feeling, as Yates has it, and the almost physical manifestation of the male figure, seemingly without her conscious knowledge, hundreds of miles away. Yet most strange, most strange of all, is what the letter doesn't know about itself. So for all that we find incomprehensible or elusive about this description of magical rites, the informed reader knows something that Yates in 1898 does not. Namely, that his two correspondents were not two separate individuals, but one person writing as two. From 1894, Sharp had sustained two writing careers, one maintained under his own name and another under the pseudonym Fiona MacLeod, who would eventually far outstrip her creator in terms of sales, celebrity and credibility. Made famous by the weighty symbolism of works like The Mountain Lovers and The Divine Adventure, MacLeod joined a new generation of self-identified Celtic writers instrumental to the rebirth of interest in Gallic, fifth, Gallic myth and folklore at the turn of the 19th century. Lauded as the first Highland novelist, she was presented in the popular press as a reticent artist, removed from society and living in the remote Western Isles. As one newspaper put it, and I quote, she is a Celt of the Celts from an old Highland family and a child of nature and the open air. From her first publication, rumors concerning the identity of this elusive writer began to circulate. Proposals included Yeats himself, the Irish nationalist Maud Gaughan, uh, the poet Nora J. Hopper, with one newspaper finally concluding in exasperated terms that, and I quote, there's no such person as Fiona MacLeod at all, but simply a syndicate of young Celtic authors who write under that name. 
This double identity was one sustained by published works and maintained in private correspondence, with Sharp's sister providing handwritten letters and manuscripts from McLeod. Though no one outside of his immediate family circle knew of the true nature of their relationship, Sharp did maintain a close public connection to McLeod, claiming that she was his cousin, reviewing her work, and even writing her bi uh, biographical entry for Who's Who. And through the closing years of the 19th century, Gates not only sustained separate friendships with both Sharp and McLeod, but he also rather preferred McLeod to Sharp. The two men had first encountered each other in 1887, and Yates's first impression of Sharp was not particularly favorable. In a letter, he recounted their first meeting and described um, having initially loathed, and I quote, his red British face of flaccid contentment. Though this initial dislike eventually softened somewhat, their relationship remained ambivalent. By contrast, Yates observed great potential in McLeod's symbolist folk tales and praised them as shiny examples of a coming revolution, or in his words, an age of imagination, of emotion, of moods of revelation. Sharp dies suddenly in, in Italy in 1901, and after that, the truth of his audacious literary doubling slowly emerged. So far, the critical response to this remarkable project has made much of its gender dynamic in how this doubling might have reflected and troubled the stern binaries of Victorian sexual morality, for example. Um, but rather less has been said of what this twinning might reveal of the models of selfhood that were being staked out in their ceremonial magic of the Golden Dawn, and then I think creatively realized in the work of the Scottish revival. Thinking once more of Yeats's sealed letter to MacLeod, it seems significant to me that though he wrote in this instance under the assumption that his two correspondents were distinct individuals, the discovery that this was not the case did not completely alter how he envisaged the connection between the two. In a letter to Maud Gone on learning the truth, he described MacLeod as representing, and I quote, a kind of semi-allegorical description of the adventures of Sharp's own secondary personality and its relation to the primary self and recounted that this secondary personality, when it awoke in him, wrote in a much more impassioned way. So one could interpret Sharp's authorial doubling, perhaps, as a kind of fragmentation of the self. But I don't think that this is quite what Yeats is getting at here. Although the magical practices of the Golden Dawn that they were all participant in relied upon the development of multiple selves, this did not constitute a kind of splitting of the eye or represent a crisis of personal identity. Instead, initiates to the order were taught how to develop a magical self, one that was not only realized through the language of the psych and the unconscious, but was rather developed on astral planes and through the exploration of real but hidden worlds that inter inter penetrate our own. In other words, I think it's important to note that the occult self cultivated through ceremonial magic at the Golden Dawn was quite distinct from the understanding of psych offered up by late Victorian medical psychology or later by Freudian psychoanalysis. So part of what distinguished this occult self from the psychological self was the conviction that through the cultivation of technique and through a deep understanding of magical texts, that it might be possible to not only transform the self, transform one's identity, but also to somehow remake uh, and re-envisage the world outside of it. Um, and it's here that the private explorations of occultists collided with the public cultures of the Scottish revival. And this connection was forged in part through a reimagining and reclaiming of folkloric traditions. So in an effort led by, in Scotland by figures like Geddes and Sharp, indigenous folk cultures were resurrected as vital political and creative resources. This restorative project guided the literary aspirations of the, the revival, involving the output of publishing houses like Patrick Geddes and Co, and inspiring collections like Lyra Celtica, an anthology of representative Celtic poetry published in 1896, uh, a volume that gathered together the native literatures of Scotland, Wales, Ireland, Cornwall, um, and, uh, uh, Bret and Breton. Um, and sorry, in Brittany rather, uh, reflecting on the pan-Celticism of this edited volume in a letter to the American journalist Horace Scudder, Sharp explained that his enthusiasm um, for the subject lay not with, and I quote, what is written in Scottish Gaelic or Irish Gaelic, but rather with uncovering the presence of a definable Celtic spirit. The search for an essential uh, Celtic spirit chimed with a broader critique of the methods and motives of institutionalized folk studies being undertaken by writers, artists, and scholars across the Celtic revival. 
In the introduction to his fairy, fairy and folk tales of the Irish peasantry, for instance, Yeats characterized the scientific pretensions of the folklore society as amounting to little more than a desire, and I quote, for tales in the form of grocer's bills, item fairy king, item the queen. Setting his own studies in opposition, the author explained his antagonism as arising from the shallow understanding of the subject encountered, by the folk, by, encountered in the folklore society. He wrote, what lover of Celtic lore has not been filled up with a sacred rage when he comes upon his, an, an exquisite story dear to his childhood, written out in a newspaper and called science. Engaging here with issues of ownership, national identity and cultural appropriation, this critique resisted a misreading of folk tales that placed them falsely within the realm of the quantifiable. More than ethnographic curiosities, for revivalists they represented important routes to self-knowledge. So this insight underpinned um, an ethnographic study of supernatural belief undertaken by the American anthropologist Walter Yeeling Evans Wentz, which was published in 1911. Um, his fairy faith in the Celtic countries argued for a different approach to folklore, ones that he one that he described as anthropopsychological, anthropopsychological. And the strength of this new method, uh, Evans once suggested, was it acknowledged that testimony regarding the regarding folklore um, could also be found in what he described as recent and contemporary psychical experiences. So discussing the persistence of fairy lore in remote regions, the anthropologist drew a, disti a direct um, a distinction between, and I quote, the natural mind of the uncorru uncorrupted Celt, which is ever open to unusual psychical impressions, and the mind of the urban dweller, which he described as being, as tends to be obsessed with business affairs, both during his waking and during his dream states. So the suggestion here is that detached from the materialist preoccupations of the metropolis, the remote Celt lives, not only lives, but thinks differently from his urban dwelling neighbors. So under the gaze of anthropo, uh, under um, under the gauge, uh, gaze of revivalists, folkloric tales came to represent more than forms of customary knowledge. They also suggested, or seemed to suggest, ancient modes of perception lost to the modern world. And revivalists were interested in exploring what cognitive spaces might be opened up by orality, what ways of thinking and visualizing might be shut off to the literate. And it was with these questions in mind that attempts were made through the closing years of the 19th century to establish an order within the Golden Dawn dedicated specifically to the exploration of Celtic magic. So the order of Celtic mysteries was, was to be based in a ruined castle on the banks of Loch Hee in Ireland, and aimed to devote itself to the use of talisman and tarot to the recovery of Celtic ancestral memory. Its founders, who included Yeats and Maud Gon, sought to synthesize folklore, ancient saga, and myth with the esoteric precepts of practical magic. And in doing so, I would, I would argue, they were attempting to forge a connection between the literary experiments of the revival um, and their own occult explorations. In Scotland, as again my fellow panelist Michael Shaw has uh, Michael Shaw's research has uncovered, Patrick Geddes was involved in planning an occult Celtic order that bore some striking resemblance to the one proposed in Ireland. The Evergreen Club, as it was to be known, was to provide an occult mirror to the activities of the Evergreen magazine, a space where the magazine's contributors could explore the mystical possibilities of their literary endeavors, where it might be possible through the development of ritual and the exploration of talisman to put the transformative possibilities mapped out in their prose and poetry into some kind of practice. Though neither the Irish order nor the Scottish club really took off, they nonetheless reveal something of how the private explorations of occultists and the public cultures of the revival came to inform one another. So coming towards a, a conclusion uh, now, in a 1902 essay, William Sharp praised Yeats as, and I quote, the priest of the symbolic who lives with symbols as others live with facts, so that to him the imagination is in truth the second sight of the mind. Written into symbolist poetics, the fabled power of second sight, so prominent in Scottish folklore, came, became exemplary of the tendency of the Celt to see, as Sharp had it, the thing beyond the thing, and to understand the everyday world as a, as a facade. Along similar lines, the practices of the Golden Dawn were at their core an espousal of exactly this principle, 
where, imagine is, where imagination is both the formative power that generates the universe and the creative faculty that and manipulates it. Which suggests to me that the, that the theories of imagination developed through ceremonial magic had some hand in shaping the literary experiments of writers like Sharp and MacLeod. Mapping where the esoteric activities of, the, of an occult order brushed up against the exoteric pursuits of revivalists, and there are many more examples um, than have been covered here in this short talk, it's clear that as part of its commitment to political, linguistic, and creative regeneration, this heterogeneous movement was invested to varying degrees and in different ways to transforming the modern subject. Looking back to myth and folklore, revivalists sought to not only articulate a discrete and valuable cultural identity, but rather to put the, pre to, but rather to put the pre-Christian beliefs, incantations, spells, hymns, and superstitions of the Celt to work in the creation of a revived self, one ready to meet the challenge and the promise of a new century. Thanks.